Good morning, good morning. I am glad to be back to be with you all. Even though literally this time last week, you know where I was, Tanya? This time last week, I was actually on a beach in Florida. Nothing will make you praise God like being on a beach on Sunday morning. I think we should probably do that more often here. I've lobbied the governor to bring a beach to Oklahoma, a real beach. So we'll see what we can do. What do you think? I know. <laughs> I'm so glad to be here. If you guys want to stand and sing, stand and sing. Let's begin by singing a song called He Reigns. And remember, as folks trickle in, we smile at them. Glad to have them here today. He Reigns. Sing out, Tanya. Just heard Cause all the powers of darkness they can't drown out a single word. It's all God's children singing glory, glory. Hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns, it's all God's children singing glory, glory. Hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory. Hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory. Hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory. Hallelujah, he reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory. Hallelujah, he reigns. Morning, Rossies. How are you? Good spring break? 
It's, I mean, only one of you actually gets a spring break, and she probably didn't take one because I know Faith. Did you actually break this this time? Did it knock you out? Well, I'm glad you got it. That's really cool. A lot of us have getting, gotten the first, about to get the second, or have had the second. So starting to feel, I don't know, more exhilarated with life. It's kind of nice. feels like doors are opening up. I am uh, grateful to be here today. We traveled a lot of miles in a, in a hurry last night to be back to worship with you guys. We really do appreciate it, uh, the opportunity to be here in person. So sing with us. We'll sing a song called Ancient Days. of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship you will be exalted, O God. And your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days. of days from every nation all of creation let us bow before the ancient of days every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory every knee shall bow at your throne in worship you will be exalted O God Pass away, O oh, ancient of days. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing unto the ancient of days. For none can compare to your matchless words. Sing unto the of days every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory every knee shall bow at your throne in worship you will be exalted O God and your kingdom shall not pass away O ancient of days O ancient of days of days well last year was kind of odd uh, for many reasons but one of the weirdest things that happened last year is we didn't have Falls Creek and that was odd for me because I've been at Falls Creek every year since 1980, 91, since 1991, oh yeah, well I think I went one year before that, so 30 years, been at Falls Creek for 30 years, yeah, 30, oh my gosh, you're an old woman, man, 30 years, so I've been at Falls Creek for 30 years, and how many of you have ever been to Falls Creek, raise your hand, if, you've, if you're in this room, you've been to Falls Creek, so nearly everyone in this room very good. Jessica, did you go when you were a kid? I know Snook. I drug him a few times to Falls Creek. Um, you you New Yorkers probably have no idea about Falls Creek, do you? No. You've been, oh, you've been down there for a men's retreat. That's right. That's right. Oh, he knows where it's at. Maz, you've been to Falls Creek before, haven't you? Yes. I'm so excited. We're going to get to go back to Falls Creek this year. 
and uh, uh, my kids are excited. I'm excited. I needed to be re-excited, so maybe it was good to take a year off. I'm ready to go back again. Tanya, you excited yet? So I, I'm excited about that. You guys already be praying about that because in a few weeks we're going to take a bus load or van load or car loads of teenagers down to Falls Creek, and we need your prayer and support. So if you're not going, then you should, you should be praying or paying or coming and visiting, helping out in some way because this is a significant outreach and inreach of our church. So make sure you guys have that in your mind. So the dates for, for Falls Creek are June something to June something. When are they? The 7th through the 12th. Uh, the only people I'm really letting off the hook uh, for making this a real priority in their life are, are, are Dakota and Lily at this point, all right? They, they, they plotted and planned their wedding the day before Falls Creek. So we're going to let them be off. We're going to let them be off for a week or so. Um, let's continue to sing. I love singing at Falls Creek. It's one of the, one of the best things about Falls Creek. And y'all aren't singing like you're at Falls Creek, just so you know. You need, to, you need to sing out, smile a little bit. At your name, the mouth shake and crumble. At your name, the oceans roar and tumble. At your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry out. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. your name the morning breaks in glory at your name creation sings your story at your name angels will bow the earth will rejoice your people cry out your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. There is no one like our God, we will praise you, praise you, there's no one like our God, we will sing, we will sing, there is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing, we will sing. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. Jesus, you are God. We will sing. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name. Filling up the skies with endless praise. Shout your name, oh Lord. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. Yahweh, Yahweh. enjoy singing way too loud in your cars when you're by yourself maybe in I know some of you Carlos you sing really loud in your car yeah you do I believe that John Rossi do you sing too loud in your car not too <laughs> it's okay to sing loud in church as well we don't care I mean we like good notes if you got them in you but what we really want is a joyful heart focused on God and uh, everything else is optional 
This is a beautiful song that Kwana will lead us out in called You Say. I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. more than just the sum of every high and every low. Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. Sometimes it, it I, I want to be candid. I want to be honest with you. Sometimes it irritates me and aggravates me and annoys me how much this, this God thing requires of me in the way of belief and trust and acceptance. I'm a sort of a concrete operational guy. I want to see the, I want to see the research. I want to see the data. I want to have the experience. But there's a lot of this relationship with God thing that requires that I place trust and faith in a God that I haven't physically seen or touched. Does that bother anybody else? On the other hand, isn't it nice to know 
that God calls us into a belief in something we can't comprehend, something much bigger than we can measure or repeat in a laboratory environment or observe empirically. He is a God that is infinitely greater than the science and logic he created. That is crazy cool to me. Thank God we can't figure him out. I don't know if we're ever going to be able to do it. Even when we're face to face with God someday, right directly in his presence, I still don't think we're going to fathom who God is. Thank God he is infinitely more than we human beings can sort out. When you sing a song like I Believe, it's got to be something real. It's got to be something you genuinely do, even though you don't sort it out, you don't feel it, you just have to choose to believe it. We sing about things we choose to believe in. This next song is called Amazing Grace, something that makes no sense at all. That God would save us, but we choose to believe that he has. In some way that makes no sense to any of us, deemed us fitting of his love and his sacrifice, and he loves us. Let's sing a song called Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind. But now I see T'was grace that taught my heart to fear And grace my fears relieved How precious did that grace appear
Father, thank you for letting us sing back the songs that you have given musicians, given the words that we're singing back to you in a language that you gave us, in a, in a body that you built and designed for us, drawing air that you have provided for us. We are grateful, Father, for every single thing that we have and are and conceive of because it comes from you. So today we give you a bit of that back as our offering today. In your name we pray. Amen. I appreciate those of you that we're here last week, as many of us were scattered to the four winds, and I understand we had an, an excellent uh, pastor come and speak to us last week. I will pass on my appreciation uh, for him bringing the word. I think it was out of Colossians, is that correct? Those that were here, was it Colossians? Do you remember? Didn't know there was going to be a quiz today, did you? Oh, excellent. Very good. I was talking to a friend of mine about, actually, I think, I think Brick Clay's favorite passages are, are uh, chapter is John 15. So I'm glad you guys got to study the Word. We did get to spend some time enjoying family and resting. It was kind of cool just to sleep till 8 o'clock some mornings. I don't know what to do with that. I mean, it won't happen anymore for the rest of the semester, but a few times this past week, it was very restful. So I appreciate my church giving me the latitude to to take off and, and drive with my family. Uh, two weeks before, um, well, two weeks ago, we started uh, a message um, that was based in the book of Ruth. Who are the central characters in the book of Ruth? Ruth, okay, good. Okay, Matt got that one out of the way. Who else? Naomi? Naomi? Boaz? Now we get to the more obscure ones. Orpha? Now, we're going we're gonna to talk about Orpah just briefly. Who else? There's like the unnamed Redeemer kinsman who wasn't. There's the townspeople. There's a couple of brothers who died off early, and Elimelech who's no longer a part of this. But it's centrally... By the way, this is a fascinating and beautiful book of the Bible. It is one of the most incredible examples of Hebrew prose that you will ever look at. It's a short story that's composed in a stunningly beautiful format. It's one of those that I wish I understood the original language. Because one of the details about this is the, the compare and contrast piece and the way that this is constructed in such a beautifully symmetrical way. You see a lot of themes in the book of Ruth. You see the, the themes of emptiness, which are found in the very first verses where we know that Naomi is empty. And what was she empty of? Life, right? Joy, happiness, sustenance. She lost her husband. She lost her homeland. She lost her home. She had nothing. The first few verses of, of, of Ruth are a, a picture of, of abject sadness. But the last few verses of Ruth. By the way, the exact, in the Hebrew, the exact same number of words are used at the end of Ruth as they are at the beginning of Ruth to give the contrast to emptiness when we see Naomi's filling and her fullness. All of the things that she had lost are restored to her and more. We see, we see examples of those who will provide and those who won't provide and those who will serve and those who won't serve. In fact, we know a little bit about Ruth because when given the opportunity by Naomi to go back to her homeland. Where was Ruth from, by the way? Moab. Moab. Ruth the Moabitess is something that we see in the book of Ruth frequently. When given the opportunity to go back, the two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, were given the chance to go home and take new husbands and provide for themselves. Orpah sought her own well-being and went home, but Ruth did what? I'm going to have to restart this whole thing if y'all aren't with me now. This, this is... I, 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 she stayed to serve, right? One who served self, one who served others. So Ruth decided to stay and serve Naomi. We see 
all kinds of beautiful pictures of God's provision in this particular book. We spent the month of February, however, talking about the ideas and the reality of racism and bigotry and injustice in our world and the way that justice and love and unity are the only things that can overcome racism and bigotry and evil and the only way we can really do the things that are necessary to to see a world restored is if we are found in Jesus Christ. Everything begins and ends with the gospel. Everything begins and ends with the gospel. The entire message of this book is the gospel. The entire purpose of this love story to us is the gospel. The the entire reason that we exist and that Jesus came is the gospel. And everything that we do must be founded in that understanding. You can't have a government reform or social justice initiative or non-government organization that will come in and save anybody from anything ever. They may feed a few folks. They may build a few latrines. They may even set up some programs. But no government stimulus check is going to give us what we need. By the way, as a little side note, on the way back home last night, Traffic was horrible in North Texas. Horrible. Nine o'clock at night. I-35 going north. Was it not madness, Maz? Was it, it was insane. I'm going like, what are all these people doing? We're north out of Gainesville. It is just like NASCAR. Because in Texas, they drive 30 miles an hour faster just because they're in Texas. It's just everything is chaos there. And we're going north, and I'm like, what is going on? Why are there so many people this late on a Saturday night? And then the very first exit, as you cross the Red River, going north on I-35, exits into what? The casino. All of a sudden, traffic got real light, because everybody was... And the parking lot of the casino was not just full. It was like, like they were parking in cornfields and getting trucked in from... I mean, it was... And I'm like, what is, oh, stimulus checks hit this week, right? It's time to get lucky with our government check. Jesse's response was, how sad. I kind of teach people to go to, 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 to gamble because I just think they're bad at math, right? It's a sign that Moz hasn't done her job as a public educator very well because people don't understand math if they go in thinking they're going to win. Look at the casino. It's nicer than your house. That's how that works. They make more money. You give them money. to make. The tribes are making bank right now. We have tax returns coming in and the government stimulus check coming in. Think about this for just a moment. People, they're genuinely placing their hope in hitting it big, and getting something for nothing so they can make more of their life. What a sad thing. Every bit of hope that we have is found not in hitting it big or a stimulus check or an education or a job or a relationship or a spouse or a child. Everything we have that's of value stems from the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's not get that twisted. Let's make sure that we have that right. Our hope is only found in Jesus Christ, and it's the only path that we can follow forward in this way. The story of Ruth and Naomi and Boaz is a story of genuine loss and hurt and despair and suffering and confusion and hunger and hopelessness. Some of you have been there before. So, like, for real. Not like, I'm kind of hungry or I'm kind of tired, I'm kind of hopeless. Like, in despair, hurting This is that story. It's a story of people who genuinely were in this darkness and without hope of anything they could do to get them out. And into this darkness shines the light of Yeshua, our Redeemer, our Protector, our Restorer, our Friend, our Savior, Jesus Christ. In chapter 1, we saw the hopeless situation laid out. You all recall this, right? So Naomi... And her family had left their homeland and gone to a foreign land, the land of Moab, because they had to feed their family. But when they got there, worse got worse got worse. Naomi's husband 
died. Her sons died. And she is left destitute and homeless and broken and without hope in a foreign land. And at some point she is at the bottom of her absolute barrel and she said, I got to go home. I got nothing left. Girls, you may, you may go back to your families. The girls obviously did not agree on what they should do because Orpah does stay in her homeland, but Ruth the Moabitess goes. They were incredibly able to see their condition. This is the problem, you see, I think in America. We've got it too easy. Even when it's bad, we're still well fed. Even when life is rough, the electricity is on. And even when we've got things to complain about, our government's keeping us safe from our, our enemies. Democracy, as ugly and messy as it is, is still a dang good system that's keeping us out of trouble. We have opportunity. We have family. We are, we are awash in provision. Now, you don't appreciate food till you're hungry. You don't appreciate water till you are parched. You don't appreciate friendship until you are lonely. You don't appreciate opportunity until you have no choices in life. And Americans have all of those things and more, and so it's really hard to see our need for the Savior when we can still scrabble our way through life and patch together something. It's one of the great deceits of our enemy to be able to keep us thinking, we got this, we don't need him. The picture of Ruth was, I don't got this. I do need someone. Naomi and Ruth went back then in their hopeless situation. They were moving from one horrible situation to another, from one day to the next, simply surviving. But in chapter 2, we see redemption appear. Something they didn't expect, probably dared, hardly dared to to think could happen, but there was an almost unbearable light beginning to appear in their broken lives. You know, this is the beautiful picture of how God reaches us, even us, in the obscure and anonymous tragedies that are our lives. In the narrative of how Naomi and Ruth find sustenance and more than that at the hands of Boaz, we see what we need from our Savior. We looked at those interesting storylines. It was worth noting here that in chapter 2, and I would say this though, that even though redemption was available, it wasn't without Ruth operating within her own agency. She still had a choice. She had several choices. She could have bailed on Naomi and stayed in Moab, and there would have been no story of Ruth in the book of Ruth. She could have stayed with Naomi in their destitute situation and just sort of wasted away, but she didn't. She got up and she went to work. She got up and went to work from morning until evening. She gleaned behind the harvesters, picking up the scraps that those who were to gather everything managed to leave behind. You see, the Levitical law commanded they leave a little behind. It was in essence, the social security system of the day. Leave behind enough so that the widows and orphans will have enough to sustain themselves. But that didn't necessarily include these Moabite women. These were not the Hebrews that the Levitical law was designed to to help. Boaz, however, saw this woman and said, who is that woman? Who does she belong to? Found out who she was and said, you guys, make sure you leave enough for her. And maybe a little extra. And through the barley harvest and through the wheat harvest, she continued to operate within her own agency to seek sustenance. She went to work. She didn't lay around and hope God mailed her something that would make her life change. She didn't just sit around the house and moan. She got to work. And even when there was no clear path, Ruth kept moving. Well, chapter 3. We're going to get into this. Redemption was made available, and now rescue is offered. I want to read the narrative of chapter 3. It's just a great story. And I want you to do what kids are especially good at doing, and adults have often grown bad at. I want you to immerse yourself in the narrative. Picture being there. Think about the way that the country would feel. It's 
its heat, its breezes, its smells, the way that people were. Think about the way that the people in this story would look and how they would act and how they would be dressed and allow your imagination to carry you into this story. Ruth 3, one day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. This is a weird story. I want you all to recognize this is a weird story. Pay attention to what's the, This is not normal behavior. This is an exceptional step. I want you to get cleaned up, hair done, perfumed, your best clothes, and I want you to go where you are not welcome. By the way, no women were allowed on the threshing floor. No women. Ever. This was out of bounds. So what Naomi is asking Ruth to do, they both understand is breathtakingly difficult. Because in essence, what she's going to do is propose to the man. She's going to suggest to someone way out of her league that he marry her. And that was just as forward then, maybe more so than it would be now. We see the dichotomies here. Ruth was a young, Moabite, poverty-stricken, completely childless, husbandless, worthless woman. She was barren, in fact. Had no children to this point. On the other hand, Boaz was a middle-aged man, well-established in his Hebrew community, with money and lands and, and standing. Really had his pick of the women that he would want to have. So you see a disconnect here. But into this, Ruth says, we will do this. Go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you're there until he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. Now don't just sort of gloss over this as if it's some sort of Bible story. This would make you and her just as breathless as you would be if you were in her situation. You want me to do what? Go to Boaz on the threshing floor? Women aren't allowed there. You want me to? I can't. I mean, I could be cast out. You want me to wait till he's sleeping and then go lie under his robe? That's not what noble women of good character do. You want me to, in essence, propose that he take me as his wife? That's not how this works. I will do whatever you say, Ruth said. This was a habit of her. She did what Naomi said. She submitted to her mother-in-law. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Can you see the picture in your mind? Does it make you a little uncomfortable to think through this? Does it make you feel a little odd to, to think about this narrative? About how I mean, think about this. How dare she approach him? How dare we approach God? How how dare we even think we would merit the attention of a Redeemer? It's an audacious thing to say that we are in any kind of a a position to to be desirable to God. And Ruth was in that same state. She laid quietly at his feet under the corner of his robe until something in the middle of the night startled him awake. Have you ever been startled awake? Last night, it was a small child banging on the door at 1237 in the morning. I was, I mean, I wasn't just asleep. I was sleeping under the mattress. I was just, he's like, Dad, why are you? He's like, I'm sleeping right here. Go away. Woman, take care of this child. So she opened the door and allowed the little monster in. He climbed up on the bed and then put all four of his feet on me and began to 
it felt like four feet, began to kick me with all four. Just startled out of my sleep. I was cranky. I was unsure what was going on. I wasn't sure. Boaz is laying there. Maybe he had a little bit of wine. Maybe a little, a little bit in good spirits. The, the, the narrative indicates he had eaten and drank. In the middle of the night, he wakes up, startled to see a woman. Now, this, there wasn't a nightlight. It was dark. But he can make out the form of a woman lying at his feet. There's actually, in my translation of the scriptures, an exclamation point at the end of that sentence, which is meant to communicate this was an exceptional moment. And he says, what he should say, who are you? And she says, I'm your servant, Ruth. And then she does the unthinkable. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. This was the pivotal moment where she said, literally, and the words are similar, take me under your wing. The, the, the corner of your garment and under your wing are similar words in the Hebrew, I'm told. Take me under your wing and care for me because according to Levitical law, you have standing and an obligation to care for me. Will you do so? Now, even though this was what was commanded in the Levitical law, as we'll see in a moment, it's not something that people did frequently because it came with strings attached. I'm your servant, Ruth. Can you imagine what she felt like as she says these words? Take me into your care. In fact, marry me and redeem my family because I have nothing. He hears and understands what she has just asked. I don't know if there was a pause, but I know that her heart must have been racing. Because he could have said, get out of here, you filthy Moabite wretch. You have nothing to offer me. You will only bring me expense and obligation and dishonor if I bring you into my fold. There's nothing here for him. But this is what he says. The Lord bless you my daughter. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You've not run after the younger man, whether rich or poor, and now, my daughter, do not be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of town know that you are a woman of noble character. This is repeated throughout the book of Ruth, by the way that we know that Naomi was, that Boaz was, and that Ruth were people of noble character. Although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good, let him redeem you, but if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here till morning. It's an interesting picture. He leaves her there, protected under his robe, keeping her safe until the morning. And then it says that as the dawn is beginning to break or as dusk comes before anybody can recognize anyone, he wakes her up or they wake. I have, I have trouble believing they went to sleep, to be honest with you. I think they were just laying there just barely breathing. But in the early morning hours, he says, here, now go back and I will take care of this. And he, he says, give me your shawl, the thing that you were wearing. And he fills it up with as much grain as it will hold. Binds it up and places it on her. And she leaves. When Ruth comes to her mother-in-law, Naomi asks, how did it go, my daughter? <laughs> Don't you know that mother-in-law was up all night long wondering about this? As she was waiting in the window, looking to see 
what would happen. And here comes Ruth back, bearing an enormous amount of grain, staggering under the load of the gift. Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me these six measures of barley, saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Naomi gets it now. Naomi understands in a moment what has occurred because she said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for this man will not rest until the matter is settled today. This man will not rest until the matter is settled today. So we see in chapter 3 that redemption is offered. And in chapter 4, we see restoration fulfilled. Meanwhile, Boaz, up bright and early, went to the town gate and sat there just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. This guy is unnamed. We don't know who he is. We know he is related to Elimelech and would therefore be next in line to guard and redeem those that would have been in the family of Elimelech. In fact, he should have already done it, if you ask me. He knew Naomi. He knew Ruth. He knew their situation. But this guy has not taken care of his family at this point. But there's an opportunity here. He says to the guardian redeemer, excuse me, Boaz took, he said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz then took 10 elders of the town and said, sit here. So what he's doing is he's, he's building a, a jury, a legal jury of his peers who would now recognize exactly what was about to take place and affirm that it was legal and proper. He did it the right way from every aspect. He said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of those seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know, for no one has the right to do it except you and I'm next in line. Now, we don't know if Naomi actually still owned the property but was so poor that she couldn't even afford the property she had and needed to sell it to keep sustaining her life, or if it had been sold and she was, in fact, legally allowed to purchase it back, but nobody would be there to purchase it back. But the property that would have secured the heritage and history of the people was at stake here. Boaz says, Brother, yours, the next in line, and legally, this land should be yours first if you want to. A very precious commodity. But if you choose not to buy this land, then I will. But I wanted to make sure you knew what was taking place. This guardian redeemer says, I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with this property. You see, he would have to, according to Levitical law, take this woman in as his wife and to keep the family name going by helping her bear children who would then acquire that property and possibly his a property if he didn't have another male heir. There was a risk there. We don't know if he had another wife or wives. What we knew, though, is as soon as he found out that Ruth was a part of this package deal, what did he say? Not bad. I just wanted the land. Don't want the Moabitess. Don't need her here. Don't need that trouble in my life. At this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. The Bible goes on to tell us that in earlier times, when you wanted to make a deal, you took off your sandal and you handed them your sandal to make a deal. Kind of an odd thing. I don't know where it came from. I'm glad we don't do that now. I signed a lot of contracts and wouldn't want to be going through footwear left and right like that. But they were going to exchange a sandal to make it official. And this was the method of legalizing transactions. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself. And he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, today you are my witnesses. That I bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. Those were the two sons that died. 
I've also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so his name will not disappear among his family and for, from his hometown. Today you are witnesses. He placed himself in a position to redeem Ruth and the property for Naomi and to be obligated by his pledge to marry her, not to just treat her as a servant or a slave or even as less than that. He said, she will become my wife. Then the elders and the people at the gate said, we are your witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this woman, may your family be like that of Perez, who Tamar bore to Judah. That's a story I don't really want to talk about today. It's kind of a crazy story. But what we know is that God's perfect will is not thwarted by man's mistake because his permissive will still allows for us to operate out of our wrecked lives within his will to see his will be done. If you go back and read the story of Tamar and Perez and Judah, it's like, oh my word, what a soap opera, what a novella their lives are. This is crazy. I can't believe they would do this stuff. But the people of that day understood that God's redemptive process would rebuild the intention of God to build a great people through this family line. I love that story. I love the fact that this occurred. Verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son or an heir and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse who was the father of David. Y'all know where this is headed, right? Mentioned in both the genealogies of Matthew and Luke, we see the family line of Jesus Christ himself coming from this story. What a powerful and beautiful, restorative story that we see. In fact, the story of Ruth ends with this, then is the genealogy of David. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz. Boaz, the father of Obed. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David. Wow. It's just like God knew all of this would occur in advance and created this incredible pathway through the debris field caused by humanity, even to see his will be done in the midst of that. Aren't you glad that no matter how badly you wreck your life, God can still fix it? Even a Baptist should say amen at that. Aren't you glad that no matter how badly you wreck your life, God can still fix it? Amen. Praise God. But there is nothing we can tear up that God can't repair. There is nothing we can destroy by our decisions or lack of decisions that God cannot work within. His perfect will will be done through his permissive will and love for his people. Four quick points and we're out of here. We see the response or the agency of the one who would be redeemed. Ruth had a choice. Several, in fact. She could have chosen to, to, to stay in Moab. She could have chosen to do her own thing when she got to, to Israel. She could have decided not to glean. She could have decided to reject Naomi's suggestion. She could have decided not to pursue this middle-aged businessman. But she exercised and chose to move toward the opportunity of the guardian redeemer 
Boaz, and you have the choice as well. You have the agency, the opportunity to choose Jesus. You personally make that choice. Your grandfather doesn't make it for you. Your uncle doesn't make it for you. Your wife doesn't make it for you. Your mother does not make it for you. You have the choice to make. But the response of the one who would be redeemed is present. Number two, the resources are there for the redeeming. Boaz could do what he said he was going to do. He didn't just spout off about, I can fix this, I can make this right. He had the resources to purchase the land and to take care of Ruth and Naomi and their child and to ensure that the redemption was made possible. There's a lot of people that promise stuff in our society. A lot of religions say, we can get you there, but they don't have the resources to redeem you. There isn't a single God, demigod, religious figure, or holy writing that is enough to get you from where you are in your sin to where God is in his perfection. It is only Jesus Christ that can do so. The resources are there for the redeeming. The third thing is the relentless love of the Redeemer. I love that phrase that Naomi utters at the end of chapter 3. For the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. For the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Boaz didn't put off the redemption of Ruth. He went first thing. He didn't eat breakfast. He didn't, he went to the, to the gates. He didn't get a strategic plan figured out. He sat down and said, hey, you redeemer, deliverer dude, sit down right here. And you ten are going to sit down. We've got business to conduct right now. The pursuit of Jesus in your life is a relentless one. You know, God doesn't give up on you because you do something stupid. He doesn't give up on you because you've lost value because of some choice in your life. You haven't. The Bible says that in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Did he really know what I was going to do? Yes, he knew what you were going to do. Man, did he know that I was going to end up like? Yes, he knew that you were going to end up. He knew that these things were going to happen. And before, that, before you were conceived, he purposed in his mind to give you a pathway to redemption. The energy and love of the Redeemer is exceptional and it is relentless. And finally, the result of this redemption we see is in restoration and provision. It's not just a, a get-out-of-jail-free card. It's not just fire insurance that you get when you accept Jesus as your Savior. It's not security for the afterlife. It's full life. I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, Jesus said himself. It's an incredible thing that we see the, the restoration and provision which are the result of redemption. We see renewal and potential fulfilled. The family line of Naomi had no future. Now, we don't understand this because this isn't that big a deal to us in Western society, but it was literally everything to the Israelites. A nomadic, obscure tribe that God had said, I will make you everything from nothing. I will make you my chosen people, from which I will bring the Redeemer of the world. Your family line is all you got, Jews. It's all you are. From your inception to your completion, you are the line of Jesus Christ. The Jews understood this. Naomi didn't have this anymore. Her family line was going to be wiped out. It would have nothing. And into this, not only did her family line continue, but it became integral to the birth of Jesus Christ himself. What an incredible renewal of potential. What are you supposed to do? Who are you supposed to be? What is your purpose in this world? Only God knows and can work through you to see that restored. He didn't give your job to somebody else just because you're not doing it. He still has it for you. He is ready and willing and able to care for his own. 
So I wonder where you are today. Are you wandering in a place of despair and loss? Are you barely surviving? Are you moving from day to day in a fog that never seems to lift? Are you in the same place that Naomi was when she said, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara? What did it stand for? Bitter. Call me bitter. Because that's what I am of nothing left. I am just bitter. There's no reason for me to have any joy in life. I am only bitter. Maybe that's where you are. Are you given to anger and sadness over what life has brought you? Are you aware of your condition today? We frequently hear of someone who felt well one day and finds out they have a terminal illness the next to go, I don't even feel sick. And yet that terminal illness is inside their body now. If you don't feel that, your sin is terminal, it doesn't mean that it's not. Are you aware of your condition? It's so easy for us Americans to grow complacent because of our own ability to provide for ourselves. Have you looked beneath the surface to see how close you are to the destruction that is headed your way? Have you genuinely thought about the plight of your immortal soul as it has been perfectly as it has been permanently stained by your mortal choices. Are you aware? Interesting. If we were to deem the two most likely to, most unlikely to connect, it would be Ruth, who's a homeless, young, destitute, foreign widow with no children, and Boaz, the wealthy landowner, well-established Hebrew leader. And yet, God brought them together. You know who's even more unlikely to connect? The perfect, infinite, complete, and holy God with us. Any of us. And yet, our God is 100% aware of who you are and where you are. He also knows where you've been where you are and where you're going. Even when you've forgotten where you've been, you're not certain where you are and you really have no idea where you're going. God has all that. And in this, he is actively pursuing your redemption and the restoration of purpose in your life. God, even in this moment, is working to see you restored no matter what happened in your life. A friend and mentor of mine, Dr. Preston Collins, recently posted something on Facebook that I want to close with today. I think Mikey has it for you, so you'll see it on the screen. Dr. Collins wrote this, Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that you may be where I am also. He was speaking to his disciples at the, the lowest moment in their lives. They were in despair and they were terrified and Jesus was speaking from the heart of the most compassionate friend you can imagine in the revelation John searched for words to describe to us what he saw he said heaven is as beautiful as a bride on her wedding day John also described heaven as a city where there is adequate protection a place of safety and security a garden where there is abundant provision, a place of prosperity and plenty, as a tabernacle where God's presence abides, a place complete and unhindered fellowship with God. Heaven is described as a new place, different from what we have experienced. 
And in Revelation, he lists the things that will not be found in heaven. There are no more sea. In other words, there's nothing that separates. There are no more tears. There's nothing that saddens. There's no more death. Nothing that grieves. There's no more pain. Nothing that hurts. No more sin. Nothing that defiles. And no more night. Nothing that frightens. We know that in heaven we can expect no ambulances, no funerals, no obituaries, no cemeteries. No arthritis, blind eyes, crippled limbs, or cancer. No broken marriages, no abused children, and no unreturned love. Dr. Collins said that should be enough to cheer the heart of every follower of Jesus. Amen? If you are a follower of Jesus you should walk away encouraged by the fact that you have been redeemed. That you have been protected and rescued by our Redeemer, Deliverer, Jesus Christ. And if you have not, then I would urge you today to condition, consider your condition before God. To ask God to say, reveal to me where I sit in relation to you so that I will know. And then see what God does. Would you stand me for, with me for a moment of prayer, please? Lord, I'm grateful for uh, the beauty of the gift of a book like Ruth. I thank you for what it um, has now come to mean to me, and I regret not having looked more deeply into it previously, but I thank you for the gift of it today. I thank you for my friends that would ponder what you would tell them through this narrative, through this story, but I'm really grateful for the Holy Spirit that stirs up our spirits and gets our minds working and gives us wisdom and knowledge to understand the things we hear. And so right now, Father, if there is anyone that needs to, to reconcile or fix their relationship with you, I hope the Holy Spirit is just screaming into their soul the love that you have for us. I thank you again for the beauty that we find in the analogy and in the narrative of Naomi and Ruth and Boaz. We appreciate, Father, the feeling of truth, uh, the feeling that truth gives us when we feel it and hear it, the comfort it brings. I thank you for the gift of your word and language to be able to understand it. Thank you, Father, for our salvation that is found in through, through Christ alone, our purpose that is empowered through Christ alone, and our future which is secured through Christ alone. And it is in Christ alone we pray. Amen. We will have house church tonight. Um, feel free to join us in person if you like. Uh, we'll gather at five. I don't know, eat some popcorn or leftovers or something and and try to get back into our sort of regular rhythm of house church. And I'm going to de actually deviate from Isaiah. We're going to be doing something a little different tonight. So if you'd like to come join us, and if you don't want to come in person, we'll still, we'll still pipe you in. You can join us virtually. I'll send you the link uh, if you'd like to come join us that way. Uh, Bible study-ish will start around maybe a little bit before 6, and we'll get rolling uh, at that time. Any questions or announcements or anything? Good to have you guys. Have a great week. We will see you later. If you don't know somebody here, get to know them a little bit. Shake a hand. Introduce yourself.